The story of missing person Jennifer Kessie is one filled with obstacles, unknowns, fences, and gates. Today, the condo complex where Jennifer lived appears to be securely gated off, inaccessible to any undesirable trespassers or onlookers. But back in 2006, these condos were still under construction, and this fence was somehow breached, allowing space for someone sinister to pass right through. And then there is the infamous fence and pool gate at Huntington on the Green, where a person of interest left Jennifer's car. Caught on camera, this gate obscured the face of a perpetrator. So little is known for certain in Jennifer's case. With dated footage and no clear picture of the suspect, just about everything is up for debate. Are they a man or a woman? How tall are they really? A bloodhound traced the scent of the driver all the way back to Jennifer's condo complex along a busy street midday on a Tuesday. This timeline puts the suspect arriving at her place minutes before her family gets there, just beginning their desperate search for Jennifer. How closely did their paths cross? Is it possible that they met her abductor that day? Join me on the path that the suspect so boldly took through populated places and in broad daylight. Let's take a walk in Orlando and discuss the mysterious case of Jennifer Kessie. Very little is known about the suspect in Jennifer's case, but we can almost certainly say that they were unfamiliar with the Huntington on the Green condominiums. The person parks her car and proceeds to walk directly in front of the only two exterior cameras in the whole complex. The timing of their steps matched to the frames of the surveillance video is so incredibly frustrating as someone who wants to see Jennifer found, but it can only be described as dumb luck for the suspect. Surely, if they knew about the cameras, they would have taken a different route. They could have just as easily gone between the buildings, actually, back this way to avoid the chance images captured on the visible pool house camera, but they didn't. Instead, the driver, referred to most frequently as the person of interest by law enforcement, parked Jennifer's car here, in this parking spot, at one minute before noon, Tuesday, January 24th, 2006. The person of interest waited 32 seconds before leaving the car, likely taking the time to wipe it clean of their prints before walking away without looking back. This person of interest is believed to be a male and appears to be dressed in workman's clothes. They still have never been identified, dubbed the luckiest criminal alive. In each image captured by the surveillance cameras, the person's face is obscured by the black bars of the fence. The Orlando Police Department requested assistance from NASA to enhance the images, but with little success. The FBI reviewed the footage and through rigorous testing estimated the person to be between 5 foot 3 and 5 foot 5 inches tall, with notably large feet for their height. They left Jennifer's black Chevy Malibu at the Huntington on the Green condo complex and according to police walked the 1.2 miles down Americana Boulevard back to where Jennifer lived at Mosaic at Millennia. This walk, which we are now embarking on, takes about 20 some minutes to complete. Jennifer's brother, Logan, was said to arrive at around 12.30 that afternoon. Was the suspect in her building when Logan got there? Who has the answers about Jennifer? Someone holds the truth. 24-year-old Jennifer Kessie was reported missing when she failed to show up for work on the morning of Tuesday, January 24, 2006. It was out of character for Jennifer not to come to work, especially without notice. So when calls to her cell were unreturned, staff at her office reached out to her family. Jennifer's parents were immediately alarmed. They also knew that if Jennifer was going to be late for work or a meeting, she would have called. Jennifer was a reliable, responsible, and career-minded young woman. When their calls to Jennifer's phone went straight to voicemail, they made the quick decision to drop everything and drive the more than 80 miles to where she lived. 
Jennifer's condo, which she had recently purchased with her own funds, was in Orlando, Florida, in the gated community of Mosaic at Millennia, across from a popular mall at Millennia. Described as loyal, loving, intelligent, and kind, Jennifer had lived in Orlando since starting college at University of Central Florida. She had studied finance and graduated in 2003. While at college, her sorority sisters nicknamed Jennifer Mother Hen because of the way that she looked after everyone, making sure her sisters were safe. Jennifer was known for being cautious and a stickler for personal safety. Prior to starting a family, Jennifer's parents, Drew and Joyce Cassie, had once been held at gunpoint during a home invasion. As a result, they often talked with their children about worst case scenarios and what to do in the event of a dangerous situation. Jennifer was known to use her cell phone to make safe calls, talking with others if she was walking to her car or home at night alone. She was an unlikely victim and not someone who would put herself into a risky position or place. Her new home at Mosaic at Millennia was supposed to be a safe and secure location. During their panicked drive that faded Tuesday, when Drew and Joyce received word that Jennifer had not arrived at work, they called everyone they could think of. No one knew where Jennifer was. They called her brother, Logan. They called hospitals. They called the police. They called the condo manager, who checked that her door was locked and confirmed that her car was not in the parking lot. That afternoon, when her family arrived in Orlando, the condo manager let them into Jennifer's home. The place was clean and orderly, mostly. Her bed appeared to have been slept in, and several outfits were laid across it. Wet towels and toiletries were out in the bathroom. It looked as if she'd gotten dressed and ready for work as normal. Her contacts were not in their case, and her new Nine West alligator pumps were gone. Jennifer's cell phone, purse, and keys were also nowhere to be found. They noticed that her suitcase was still packed and had been set down by the door. Jennifer had just returned from a trip to St. Croix with some friends and her boyfriend, Rob Allen. Rob Allen was a British expat living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, about three hours south of Orlando. The two had been dating for a year and showed their commitment by frequently making the long drives to see each other on the weekends. Their flight back from the Caribbean had returned to Florida late Sunday night. Jennifer had woken early the next day, on Monday, to make the drive from Rob's home in Fort Lauderdale straight into work at her job at Central Florida Investments. Jennifer excelled at work and had already been promoted twice at the resort and timeshare company. After spending a full day at the office, she left at around 6 p.m. It's the last confirmed sighting of her since 2006. On the way home from work, she called her parents and chatted with them about her fun vacation. She had been in good spirits, upbeat and positive. It was the last time they ever spoke to her. The last known contact with Jennifer was a call that she made to her boyfriend, Rob, at 9.57 p.m. Monday night. They had argued a little. Despite the wonderful tropical trip, a conflict spurned by the long distance in their relationship had soured their last phone call. Because of this disagreement, Rob had not completely panicked when Jennifer had not called him on her way to work that next day, even though the call was part of her usual morning routine. Maybe she was still grumpy about what had been said the night before, he thought. He called her at work but was told that she had not yet arrived. When she missed an important meeting that morning and still no one could reach her, Rob knew that something terrible had happened. He told reporters, she's not that kind of person to just walk off. She's very responsible. Other than their spat on the phone that night before, at no time had Jennifer shown any evidence of discontent with her life, her relationships, or her career. But she was an adult, and with no signs of a struggle or a crime, police weren't sure what to think. Her tracks seemed to cease from the time that she usually left her condo for work, around 7.45 that day. Perhaps she had been just so upset about a fight with Rob that she needed some time to cool off. The police decided to wait. Her family, however, was convinced of a disaster. 
they jumped into action, making flyers for distribution that very afternoon, within hours of her disappearance. Their swift response was both impressive and inspiring. And later that evening, when Jennifer still had not returned home, police declared her a missing person. But law enforcement initially pursued a theory that Jennifer had been abducted late Monday night and not Tuesday morning, based on some cell tower data. Her parents refuted this theory vehemently. The police's proposed timeline of a late night outing did not match the behavior that they expected of Jennifer. It was not how the career focused young woman would have acted. And it was later determined that several cell phone pings had been misinterpreted. This incorrect data had led police to believe that she had been out and about very late that night before, when really she had not been. This meant that in the early days, there was no police focus on Jennifer's condo. It was not examined by crime scene technicians. Jennifer's family's focus was placed solely on finding Jennifer, which meant staying in Orlando. It meant staying in Jennifer's condo. Her mother described how she felt in those early days. Quote, we were basket cases, she said. There was panic, sheer panic. Two days into their nightmare, on Thursday, January 26th, police were notified that Jennifer's black Chevy Malibu had been found abandoned at the Huntington on the Green condo complex, just over a mile from where she lived. They brought Jennifer's boyfriend, Rob, to the car for the reveal of an empty trunk. Jennifer was still missing. Law enforcement sorted through area dumpsters looking for evidence and video from two cameras on the property were recovered. Valuables, including a DVD player, had been left in Jennifer's car, indicating that the motive for moving it had nothing to do with a robbery or a carjacking, but with Jennifer herself. Only Jennifer's fingerprints are found in the vehicle, supposedly wiped clean by the suspect during the 32 seconds that they remained in the car upon arrival. The Kessie family is told that no DNA was recovered. That same day, an Orange County Sheriff's dog named Bo traced the suspect's scent from the parking lot all the way back to Mosaic at Millennia, Jennifer's home. Reports vary quite a bit about where that scent ended. The Orlando Sentinel reported on January 27th that Bo arrived right back at Jennifer's condo door, while another source reported that the dog led investigators to the stairs that led up to her home. Yet another stated simply that the dog lost the scent on the condo property. Reports also differ on how and where the fence was breached, some saying that there was a gap in the fencing, while others seem to imply that the fence had been climbed. Either way, all agree that the gatehouse had been avoided. Police were given access to search all of the unoccupied units at Mosaic at Millennia, though the condos that were occupied were only searched with the owner's permission. They also performed a grid search of some woods near to Jennifer's apartment complex. Video surveillance footage from all along this road, the route, was collected, but none of it captured the suspect in her vehicle or on foot. Her family continued to make media appearances, distribute flyers, and create large posters with Jennifer's information on them. The publicity was paying off, and a couple had come forward. They had seen Jennifer's car swerving out of her condo complex that Tuesday morning. They estimated that it had occurred at about 7.40 a.m., but couldn't remember which direction it had turned. It further bolstered the family's timeline that Jennifer had been taken Tuesday morning rather than while out and about that night before. A large-scale search was announced for Saturday, February 4th, and more than a thousand people showed up to hand out flyers and look for Jennifer. That same day, police released the two images of the person of interest walking by the pool gate. They did have more footage of the car drop, but despite accidentally releasing the video, they asked media not to share it with the public. They had wanted to use the video to check against the story of any suspects they may have interviewed. 
but after months of debate between Jennifer's parents and detectives, and all solid leads exhausted, they finally decided that it would be more useful to show to the public. The grainy and out of focus pool house footage shows her car parking and the suspect walking away. Its timestamp is off by an hour, but they hope that releasing the images from the second camera will generate new leads about that person of interest. Orlando Police Chief Mike McCoy said, quote, we're absolutely positive someone has information we need to bring that young lady home. So far, detectives had looked into over 1,000 leads, and several teams of investigators had reviewed the case, but all had come up empty-handed. Orlando Police Lieutenant John O'Grady said, the most frustrating thing for a detective is a whodunit. We don't have a body, and we don't have a suspect identified. Jennifer's boyfriend, Rob, who had initially been considered for her disappearance, had been completely cleared by authorities. His alibi checked out and put him several hundred miles away when she was abducted. Just one hour after the press conference, real estate mogul David Siegel, owner of Central Florida Investments, Jennifer's employer, and co-star of the famed documentary Queen of Versailles, announced that he would increase the $250,000 reward for her safe return to $1 million. One of the early tips that came through the crime line was about a maintenance worker at Jennifer's condo complex named Chino. The tip had been submitted anonymously and suggested simply that Chino might have been involved in Jennifer's disappearance. For nearly three years, this tip sat languishing in a pile of investigation files until one of the Orlando police detectives decided to get a fresh look into the investigation and interviewed some of the former staff at the condo complex which had not been previously interviewed. Detective Joel Wright spoke with a former housekeeper for Mosaic at Millennia, and when shown the videotape of the suspect walking away from Jennifer's car, she believed that the person resembled Chino. She said that the hair, the clothing, and the way that he walked reminded her of Chino. As it turns out, Chino had done work on Jennifer's condo the week before she disappeared. But by the time that Wright learns this, it is 2009 and Chino has been incarcerated. He's serving time for a statutory rape charge, a crime committed in the years since Jennifer's disappearance. Detective Wright interviewed Chino in prison and asked him about the work that he completed in Jennifer's condo. Chino admitted that he had met Jennifer and that she let him inside her condo. Everything was normal, Chino said. I don't have any idea what happened to her. At first, he seems like a good suspect, but then again, Chino is five foot nine inches tall, much taller than the FBI estimate for the driver of Jennifer's car. And he's also very cooperative during the interview. He took a polygraph test and he passed. Detective Wright does say, quote, I would never rule someone out just because they passed a polygraph test, unquote. But at the same time, there is no additional evidence against Chino, only this one tip and the word of the housekeeper. Ultimately, Chino has not been charged with any crimes related to Jennifer or her case. Time does little to fade the wounds and the scars of Jennifer's disappearance on her loved one's lives. Drew tells the media that it still feels incredibly raw to her friends and family. He says, we understand the odds of finding her alive. Still, Drew said, Jennifer deserves their tireless efforts because she was the kind of person who would never stop if she were in their place. They have been trying to get the Orlando Police Department to declare the case cold, which would grant additional investigative resources, but had been told instead that it was very active. And so they waited. In 2016, after 10 years had passed since Jennifer was last seen, she was declared dead by the state of Florida. Drew calls it one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. At a press conference on the 12th anniversary of her disappearance in 2018, the Kessie family announced that they had gathered a team of lawyers and investigators. 
They wanted to take a look at the case files because they believed that the investigation had gone cold. The Orlando Police Department countered this claim. Standing in front of a large city bus with Jennifer's picture on it, a spokesperson said that they had generated 160 leads in her case in just the last five years. Orlando Police Chief John Mina said, quote, all of our cases are active. It's not our practice to turn over files or case notes or information to anyone in the public. We believe that could possibly jeopardize our investigation as well as set a precedent for future investigations. He spoke about assigning a full-time employee to the case and sharing images of the person of interest from the video footage on 18 digital billboards around the city. Jennifer's brother, Logan, however, was visibly disappointed in the police chief's words, shaking his head as Chief Mina spoke. This is a joke to me, he said, calling it a, quote, slap in the face. He did not believe that the police department would be doing any of these things had they not gotten their attorneys involved. But Jennifer's father, Drew, said, we don't hold this against, so to say, the Orlando Police Department. We understand how hard it has been. In March of 2019, a legal settlement was reached, and the Kessie family received more than 16,000 pages of case file documents and 67 hours of audio and video. Under their new agreement, the Orlando Police Department no longer leads the investigation into Jennifer's disappearance. Their team of lawyers and private investigators immediately dove into the thousands of files they received. Michael Toretta is one of the private investigators who works for the Kessies. He learned that in late 2006, about 10 months after Jennifer's disappearance, a person was seen dumping rolled up carpet into a lake not far from Jennifer's condo. Toretta told 48 Hours that on the day that Jennifer went missing, workers were laying down carpet in the apartment across the hall from Jennifer's condo. So in November of 2019, Local police brought a dive team in to search the lake where that eyewitness had said the piece of carpet had been dumped. They spent two days searching the lake, but found nothing. The construction workers employed by Mosaic at Millennia continue to be a focus for the Kessie's investigative team. Jennifer had told her family that their presence around the condo complex sometimes made her uneasy. When the workers spent time in her condo, Jennifer would be extremely cautious, said her father, Drew. Quote, she would stand there at the front door with it open and have me or someone else on the phone the whole time. Logan, Jennifer's brother, also had tried unsuccessfully to ask some of the workers about Jennifer on the day that she went missing. He had found them to be particularly uncooperative. The Private Eyes also spoke with other women who had lived in the condos back in 2006. One of them reported finding a peeping Tom outside her condo one day. The investigation at Mosaic at Millennia in the early days was lacking, and there were still many questions about Jennifer's abduction. Did she make it out of her apartment on her own? Was she taken in her parking lot or on her way to work? The Kessie family discovered some images of Jennifer's car in the police files that were cause for concern. Mike Toretta said, quote, the photos look suspicious and show what appears to be a hand mark going across the hood of the car. Was this evidence of a struggle on the front hood of her vehicle? The family additionally learned that DNA had been collected from Jennifer's car, despite being previously told that none had been found. Given recent advancements in genetic genealogy, this new information is a reason for hope, for quick resolution and answers. But details on this evidence, like where the DNA was located or how much of it was found, is sparse. Last year, Drew Kessie accused the Orlando Police Department of negligence in Jennifer's investigation. They declined to call it a cold case for years, but found that when they received the files in 2019, the lead detective had not written a single report or any document since 2010. Mr. Kessie wrote, quote, We firmly believe the department's negligence and lack of competency cost Jennifer the chance to be found. Because Jennifer's family have taken on the investigation on their own, they do have a GoFundMe, which I will link prominently in the video description. 
Money donated helps to fund the search for their daughter, which they will not give up. Jennifer's mom, Joyce, said, The hole in our heart is forever there until we have an answer. I encourage you to share Jennifer's story and the pictures of the suspect in her case, which can be found on their website, jenniferkessie.com. Anyone with information about Jennifer's disappearance should please call the crime line or the Kessie family tip line. <laughs>